So when this started, I knew I wanted to go first because the other presentations were going to be so awesome, and they have been. Uh, and so kind of going back to the first presentation, talking about vulnerability, I'm used to a little bit more of a drier space. So uh, it's going to be a little bit more dry compared to what you've seen. But it's something that I do care about, and it's something that I am passionate about, and it's something that I do think applies to uh, all of us in this room, even if it's not something we see every day. And at least the topic is fun, right? It's drones. Uh, I don't know. Do we have any drone owners? Has anyone flown a drone, own a drone? OK, we have a couple. Have you ever crashed them? Uh, yeah, I, I, I flew one right into someone's hair uh, pretty badly. She was OK. It was a little tiny joke. <laughs> but yeah, they, but they're out there, and they're growing. And this is something that the city is dealing with. And that's what I uh, wanted to talk about that from the context of policy. So a little bit about me. Uh, who am I? I am the executive director of Startup Policy Lab. We are a nonprofit uh, committed to making government more open, accessible, and transparent. So uh, my work as an attorney, though, is very policy-oriented, so I can't answer any of your legal questions. Uh, I can talk about privacy. I can talk about open data. I can talk about public comments and a few other things. Uh, but I, I tend to be more in the weeds on the laws and regulations and policies as opposed to uh, what you might be used to with others. I am also the public appointed member, uh, a public appointed member. There are two of us on COIT. COIT is the Committee on Information Technology here in San Francisco. I'm going to come back to this. That's the reason I'm bringing it up, not just to talk about it for kicks. Uh, and that organization, or that committee, excuse me, sets the IT policy for all government, or excuse me, city and county uh, agencies in San Francisco. So an example of that would be everything from uh, an open source procurement policy, data privacy policy, things of that nature. So that's what COIT sets, and all the agencies have to follow that in the city and county of San Francisco. And then finally, I won't go too much into the politics, but yes, I am running for office. I am a native of San Francisco. Uh, and the reason I'm doing that is because I believe there are a lot of opportunities that we are missing right now. And if we have a vision for the future that incorporates a little bit more about what we can do, a little bit more of a get, get the solutions done approach. We can do a lot and we actually help a lot of people. But I won't belabor that point. I'm happy to talk about it afterwards. So uh, what do I mean when I talk about policy and design? Uh, what we've come up with is this model we call the tech policy stack. It, it works for both kind of tech people and non-tech people to kind of discuss where technology and policy intersect. Uh, at, the, at the bottom of that, uh, you'll see, and we're going to work our way up, you'll see laws. And by laws, we mean things that are in the city code. So they are, we are required to do that by law. So we must have a chief data officer. That is in the code. Above that, we're gonna, this is what we're going to talk about. That's why it's highlighted. Our administrative policies. That's what we're going to talk about today. Administrative policies are quasi-legal rules. So they're not a law. They're not a regulation but they're what agencies have adopted internally that dictate how they have to operate. Anyone who's worked at a big company, uh, think of it as an HR policy. It's very similar. Uh, but with the government, it ends up having these broader implications because, uh, believe it or not, when you interact with the government, these are probably the rules that you're not seeing. I should be pointing this way, sorry. These are the rules that you're not seeing that's dictating how the government officials are interacting with you. So that's the world that I play in, and that's the world we're going to talk about. Above that is infrastructure. Uh, think of that as uh, massive capital investments. Roads is a good example, but in the IT space, think servers, uh, think fiber. Uh, so once you make that investment, you're not going to see a lot of changes after that. So you have these legacy effects. And then finally, the, the sexy thing, the thing that usually you hear about in the news when it's like civic tech and how we're going to fix government, are applications. Uh, applications are at the top of that, top of that stack. For our, for our purposes today, that's going to be uh, drones. So a, an application could be your mobile app. It could be something you're doing that engages with the city. But it's also a drone. Uh, it's something that the city's using uh, internally to get things done. So the way policy tends to work, and this is kind of across the board, is it's very reactive. Uh, something bad happens. There's a lawsuit. There's an accident. And so we have to uh, quickly issue a policy. It might be from an agency. Uh, it could be uh, a good example of this would be San Francisco Police Department working on uh, body cameras. Right? There's a big concern about how are we going to manage body cameras. We have to come up with something. We've got a lot of problems. Let's go with policy, and let's move forward. That happens with a little bit of uh, public input, not a lot of public input. And so what often happens is we have this kind of breaking point. So the policies break. We have to go back. We have to do it all over again. But it's all kind of hidden. In San Francisco, this happened with drones. And there were three factors that kind of drove this conversation. Number one, uh, city departments were pushing to use drones uh, in everything that they were doing. Uh, and Park. Uh, Public Utilities Commission, Fire Department, all wanted to use drones for a variety of different use cases. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Uh, number two, uh, everyone was worried that if public uh, agencies started to use uh, drones about surveillance, what's going to happen when you have uh, cameras up everywhere? Uh, we have cameras now in terms of like the street lights if you go out there for license plates, but it's a little different when you have a drone that can hover over your backyard, capture video, 
uh, audio and other factors, or other, uh, other um, parts of information. They pull that, they suck it in, and then it can get shared with law enforcement, and there's no control over that. And then the third was an accident. Uh, some people might have been aware this happened several years ago. A drone crashed into the ferry building window. So it crashed into the little higher windows. So when it crashed, the glass shattered <laughs> below. Nobody was hurt, luckily. Excuse me. But what it did is it started to scare uh, the city in terms of how we have to get, you know, how do we get a handle on this? So what they did is they put a, they put the kibosh. No, no city agency can use drones, right? So we couldn't move forward. We couldn't move backward. We're just kind of stuck in this purgatory space. And then city administrators came up and said, okay, we've got a policy idea, let's just do this, here's a bright line rule, and let's move forward. The committee that came up with that rule was COIT. That's the committee that I serve on, the Committee on Information Technology. Uh, that committee was able to come up with a policy, but they did it without any public comment, they did it all internally. And that's okay in the sense that that's common practice. They weren't trying to be uh, evil or, or you know, there's no, there's no bad intent behind that. But the problem was they're setting up a policy and they're doing bright line rules and we didn't know what was gonna happen. So our organization had a chance, uh, we we're working with UC Berkeley's Center for Technology, Society and Policy, to work with them and kind of go back to square one and say, hey, if we're gonna build this policy out, we have an opportunity to think about how we can build policy that can iterate with technology. So don't just think about this from the drone concept. Drones are just gonna be our basic starting point. We'd ideally like to use this as a model that we can use in other areas where technology is starting to drive the conversation. So we asked two questions. Uh, number one, does the agency have a privacy data? So at the time, over 20 agencies were saying to city leaders, hey, we wanna use drones. So we said, okay, let's just ask them if they have a data privacy policy. And almost all of them, to a T, said, yes, we do have one. And we said, that's great. Can you send it to us? Nine did, the rest of them did not. So then we said, okay, next question, does the data privacy policy apply to drones? Well, of course, it's a data privacy policy, right? It didn't. It applied to the street lamps that I mentioned. So when they were capturing the license plates. Again, it's very different when you have a privacy policy that is with a stationary camera that is just taking pictures of license plates when, versus you have a data privacy policy that, refer, that is around a drone that can hover over my backyard and take pictures of me and take pictures in my window, right? Two very different types of privacy policies here are required. So that got us down to zero. Nobody, uh, none of the agencies were prepared, the city wasn't prepared, but we had a policy, so we kind of moved to step two. All right, uh, of those nine, let's stick with, we stuck with those nine, we said, okay, do you have a use case, right? Like, how are you going to use this? Now, this might seem pretty common to many people in this room, private industry, oftentimes you have to have a use case before you move forward on something. We just had fear driving us. We didn't really have a good use case. So nine said, yes, we have it. The reality was six had an actual use case. Those other three were kind of like, you know, drones are cool, we just wanna try them out. <laughs> Which I get, you know, you can get the city to buy you a drone, that's fine. Uh, and then we asked uh, those six, can you provide that use case in a standardized format? And by standardized format, that meant we put together about roughly nine questions that said, can you put, you know, what you wanna do and in, in in describe it in these, uh, answering these nine questions. I'm not gonna bore everybody with those nine questions. But uh, what we found is that five of them could do that. Uh, one of them was not able to do that. And the importance of doing that when we think about policy is all of a sudden, right now, we had, or at the time, we had five use cases that we could then compare from, uh, against each other. So we had five different agencies. We could compare their use cases across each other. And then we could use that over time. So if we keep that structure going forward, we can always go back and look at that. And then finally, it meant that we had uh, developed a process that other agencies eventually could copy. So it's scalable, to use more of a technical approach. It's like, oh, or a technical uh, framework. We could actually scale this process going forward. It could be copied by other cities. So the five cities that ended up, or excuse me, the five agency, uh, agencies that ended up uh, providing use cases uh, were a little bit surprising. Uh, it was the controller's office, the fire department, public utilities commission, the port, uh, recreations and parks. Uh, believe it or not, by the way, Recreations and Park, Rec and Park, if you're not familiar with them, they, they have like, the best software developers and engineers in there. They were the most technically astute of the entire group. And that wasn't to say that these groups weren't, it's just that Rec and Park was really actually above, above, the, uh, above the norm. Uh, we ended up doing a workshop internally with the, uh, the agencies that wanted to participate, even those that uh, didn't end up final, like, getting to that final group of five. So think of those nine, about nine to, I think, 12 that participated. And what we get, pulled out of that, that same Rec and Park group, they actually started teaching the other agencies. Um, their use case was like on point. It was perfect, basically. Um, and they had a lot of expertise and knowledge that we didn't even know they had. 
And so they were able to start doing almost a peer-to-peer -peer kind of education. So that took us out of the room to some extent, and then the agencies could start learning from each other, which is very powerful. So to give you an idea of some of the things we learned from these uh, use cases, and we were able to take this back to, uh, uh, back to the city administrators to get them to slow down as well, was we started looking at the risk of data exposure. And this is a big deal. Uh, you'll see it's red is a high risk, orange is a medium risk, green means you're probably okay. But in reality, what this means is red means lawsuit. Think ACLU, EFF, private lawsuits. Uh, orange means you're probably gonna get a lawsuit, maybe a unit from the union or something. Uh, and green means you're probably unlikely to have a lawsuit. This is actually how we got a lot of attention uh, from the city administrators as saying there's money at stake. <laughs> but we wouldn't have gotten to this comparison point. You can see there's uh, six stakeholders in eight different contexts. If we hadn't had the five use cases, that we were able to extract that information out of and then take that and learn and build off of it. So it's always difficult to talk about policy. Normally this is fairly, it's already fairly pedantic. Uh, I don't have as many pictures, so I, I apologize. But, uh, what is helpful is to see an A and B situation, where we started and where we ended up and what that means. So the original policy, that one that we first got that was driven by fear or FUD, right, uh, was a bright line final policy. It applied to every single agency in the city of San Francisco, so about 50 of them. There was no standard for uh, use case review and it included law enforcement, which was scaring everybody. By the end of this process, which took about two years, uh, the adopted policy has an annual policy review. So every year, the Committee on Information Technology now just takes a second and has to review it. Are we still okay? Do we need to adjust this? Has anything changed? Uh, only five agencies were started. Instead of trying to have all kind of 50 or 20, if you will, at the, at, the, at the beginning, I think now they've added a few more agencies because of those use cases that we've developed. They have models to move forward on. We have a data-driven review, so that goes back to that structure that I talked about, all of a sudden now there's information and some of that's quantifiable. So instead of just being hidden qualitative kind of measurements where it's institutional memory within in all, the, all the dark words that make bureaucracy scary, now all of a sudden that information is public, it's published, you and I can go look at it, other agencies can go look at it, other cities can go look at it, and we're gonna be able to look at that over time. And so we can go back and forth and see how things are going and trends. And finally, we took law enforcement off the table, not because we were anti-law enforcement, in fact, uh, SFPD was pretty amenable to that because they didn't want to be a, a controversy. They didn't want to be controversial. Uh, but by taking them off the table, that one little issue, it turned out that we were able to have a much broader conversation. Uh, now they'll come back into play. At some point, uh, SFPD will obviously you know, get involved with drones, but right now they don't need to be. And that's kind of the lesson learned from that. One unexpected consequence or benefit that came out of this, uh, if you remember a few slides back, I mentioned when we asked for data privacy policies, nobody had one, they all thought, a lot of them thought they had one. Well, we realized on the committee, we need a data privacy policy, and we need a data privacy policy that applies to everyone, because a lot of the agencies do not have the sophistication or skills to develop it on their own. So what's come out of this, separate from that, if you go on the website, is you'll see that San Francisco now has a data privacy policy, uh, and that's all because of this process that we went through. Uh, three takeaways, um, advances in technology require new approaches, and we have to keep thinking about that as we're going forward and we try to include technology into government. We wanna make it better and more effective and equitable for everybody. Data-driven policymaking is going to require new frameworks. This is a great opportunity for those I say in the space, if I could recruit you and more experience and expertise than I have with the design uh, skills that you mentioned earlier, design approach. Uh, we need to start incorporating that into our policymaking. And finally, use cases. Uh, any way we can figure out how to bring use cases uh, faster to the, to the fore is better. And that's similar to what you were talking about with the work, um, the resilience work uh, with the Mars Academy, is if you can find out what those use cases are faster uh, in a smaller space, there's ways we can learn from them and we can move forward. So with that, I will stop. Uh, uh, thank you so much uh, for letting me talk. And I'm happy to talk both after this or if you'd like to email me uh, separately, but I'm always trying to encourage people to get involved in civic tech and gov tech and help make a difference and help make our city and our government work better for everybody. Thank you.